Hello, and welcome to Rev. Collins Reflections and Wingham United Church once again. Uh, this service is being prepared for September 11th, 2022. Give thanks to God for this day. The glory of God's creation is spread before us. Give thanks to God for our life's blessings, the love of family and friends surround us. Give thanks to God for this hour of worship the opportunity to praise and to pray, to listen and reflect is a gift of grace. Let us worship God. And as always, we begin our worship by lighting the Christ candle as a visible reminder of Christ's presence among us. And we join me for our opening prayer. God of love, we come together today in this sacred time set aside as sanctuary from the rush and hustle of our day-to-day -day living. We are aware of cooler nights, shorter days, and ripening crops. We spend less time at our cottages and camps. Our children have returned to their studies. Life picks up speed and imposes more responsibilities on us all. And so we return to our regularly scheduled programming. As we return to the life we call normal, we accept that we also have greater need of time with you. So we also return to this place and time to find rest for our souls and drink for our thirsty spirits. As we open our hearts to your presence, we pray that your Holy Spirit will feed and nurture us, giving us the strength, courage, and determination to love the next, to live the next seven days as children of God forgiven and forgiving, loved and loving, journeying in peace and thanksgiving, just as Jesus taught us. And so we pray the words that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our opening hymn this week, accompanied by the Wingham United Church Choir, is number 574 from Voices United. Come, let us sing of a wonderful love.
and welcome back to Brother Bear's study once again. Uh, as always, let's open this uh, part of our worship service with a prayer for Christ's illumination of the scriptures that we're about to examine. Let's pray. Mighty God, we read our scriptures seeking a word from you. Speak now into our hearts that these ancient words may come to life within us and help to shape us into the image of Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be guided and inspired by your Spirit, O Lord, our strength and our hope. Amen. Well, we're going to begin our scripture readings this week with a reading from Jeremiah once again. Uh, this week we're reading from chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 11 and 12, and then we jump ahead quite a bit, and we read verses 22 to 28. At that time, it will be said to his people and to Jerusalem, A hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights in the desert toward my poor people, not to winnow or cleanse a wind too strong for that. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them. For my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil but do not know how to do good. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked to the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, The whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not make a full end. Because of this the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above grow black. For I have spoken, I have purposed, I have not relented, nor will I turn back. Harsh, harsh words indeed from the prophet. We turn now to uh, something a little more uh, pleasant and, and lighthearted uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I have received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the Ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And, and finally, we turn once again to the Gospel of Luke, this time chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Now all the collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus, and the Pharisees and scribes were grumbling and saying, This, this fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he fi has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Here ends 
this week's scripture lessons and may the spirit uh, enlighten our minds to the meanings uh, of these readings. Well, Jesus asks an interesting question of the Pharisees and scribes. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? Well, I wouldn't. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to put 99% of your stock at risk to go find that 1% that may be lost forever. It's foolishness. I would make certain the other 99 were in a safe, secure location. Then I would venture out looking for the one who had wandered off. But I would never abandon the 99 in the wilderness. Rather, I, I prefer the parable of the woman in the lost coin. While she is so diligently searching for the one that is lost, we can assume that the other nine coins are still in a safe place. Coins do not wander off on their own. Well, on the other hand, they also cannot return on their own. Someone must find them. The point, of course, is that Jesus seeks out the lost. And when that lost soul is recovered, heaven rejoices. The angels sing and God smiles broadly. For the Pharisees and scribes, it was pretty clear then that Jesus was acting completely counter to the cultural norms that they would follow because these tax collectors and sinners need him. And the uh, temple officials apparently do not. They are among the 99 that are safe and sound. Or so they believe. But are they really? Repeatedly throughout the Gospels, Jesus confronts the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, calling them hypocrites, accusing them of paying lip service to the scriptures but not following God with their hearts, of being more concerned about ritual and protocol than about people in need. Can he really, in this instance, be suggesting that they do not need repentance, that they are truly righteous, and so have no need of Christ's time and attention. It hardly seems likely. Perhaps what he is really saying to them is that he can only help those who admit they need his help. Those who think they have things all figured out, who believe they are among the righteous and saved, will perhaps not return to the flock even if Jesus finds them and welcomes them in. The tax collectors and other sinners who come to Jesus to hear what he must tell them realize that they're lost and they're asking to be found. They're out shouting out from the wilderness hoping that God hears their cries. They are the ones Jesus is seeking out. The Pharisees and scribes are perhaps far more lost because they refuse to admit the fact that they're like the stereotypical male driver who's so convinced he can find his own way that he refuses to stop and ask for directions. It isn't that the Pharisees and scribes did not need to repent, but Jesus knew they were not ready. To go to them with the same message he shared with the tax collectors would only put them on the defensive, attempting to justify their actions and rationalize their behaviors. They refused to admit they were lost and instead got angry. So Jesus spent his time with those who would allow themselves to be carried home on his shoulders. Fortunately, there's good news for the scribes and Pharisees as well. Paul, who was once one of the most dedicated and powerful among them, writes to Timothy how grateful he is that Jesus came looking for him. He admits that though he was among the greatest of Pharisees, he was among the worst of sinners, but he made those errors out of ignorance. He did the things he did with the best of intentions. He, he did the wrong things, but for the right reasons. For that reason, he was shown mercy and received grace. And because of that, he became an example to follow for billions of people since. Would we be worshiping together today? if not for the ministry of Paul, the lost sheep that Jesus searched for and brought back to the fold.
the real question for us then is, where do we fit into this story? Are we among the lost or the found? Who do we resemble more, the tax collectors who come to Christ asking to be shown the way home, or the Pharisee who thinks he knows the way, but is equally lost and further from being found because of his own pride, arrogance, or ignorance? There is, of course, a third option. One could be truly saved, safe and secure among God's flock. But how can we be sure? What exactly does that look like? I should make something clear at this point. When many people talk about these things, they're looking ahead to the, the next level of existence that comes after we die to this one. Heaven to them is some distant land beyond our current vision. But I believe that heaven is right here among us, all around us, even within us. We have the choice right now to participate in the kingdom of God as we live this life. C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, The Great Divorce, I think earth, if chosen instead of heaven, will turn out to have been all along only a region in hell. And earth, if put second to heaven, to have been from the very beginning a part of heaven itself. That does not mean that suddenly life will be all roses and sunshine. Even for those Christ has found, trouble comes, tragedy occurs. Shortly after writing his letter to Timothy, Paul was imprisoned because of his faith and eventually died there. Participating in God's kingdom, however, impacts the way we respond to the calamities and losses of life. It's more about our spiritual health and wholeness, which greatly impacts our emotional and mental health and even our physical well-being. What affects our physical existence does not have to dictate our peace, contentment, or joy. We see countless examples of this in the world around us. People in developing nations who barely have enough to survive are content and joyful in their lives, and their churches are filled with grateful worshipers. In fact, someone from Africa recently told me that they are opening new churches every day where he is from. Meanwhile, people in the Western world, living in the top 8% of the world's wealthy elite, are miserable, and churches are closing for lack of participants and supporters. The material world does not need to dictate our spiritual well-being. I'll give you an example from my early years in ministry. I was once asked to visit someone in palliative care. Now, she had not been a member of the congregation I served, but a, a caring member who was knew she was struggling and thought perhaps I could help. So one Sunday afternoon, I drove to London wandered around that gigantic hospital until someone finally directed me to her room, which was hidden in behind a nurse's station. I learned that she was actually a person of deep, deep faith, but extremely introverted. So she didn't attend church, and she didn't participate in congregational life. Now, she had been convinced by a relative, who was also a person of strong faith, but held a a theology quite a bit different than my own, that this woman had not done enough with her life to earn God's favor. Now, she knew she was dying, and she was now terrified that she would not see heaven. So I talked to her about grace and the faith and love of God and Christ. I shared with her my interpretation of a couple of Christ's teachings. And I assured her that I was absolutely certain that Jesus was waiting to take her home at the appropriate time. The very fact that she was asking these questions made me certain that she was going to be just fine. The following evening, her husband called to tell me that she had passed away earlier in the day, surrounded by her family. I don't know what you said to her yesterday, he told me. But she was a different person when we arrived this morning. I'm not sure how to describe it except that for the first time in weeks, she seemed at peace. She was finally ready to go. Now, I believe firmly that in that 
challenging situation. The Spirit gave me the words she needed to hear. And it was her humility that opened her heart to hear the words I offered. She didn't try to justify herself, to make excuses or blame others. She humbly admitted that she needed God's grace, and in that admission, she received it. None of us earn our way in through actions or behavior. Scripture makes that very clear. What gets us there is being willing to respond when Christ calls our name and guides us back to the fold. Psalm 51 verse 10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. That might be the best prayer of confession any human has ever voiced. That new and right spirit makes everything else in the world bearable. But it cannot come to the soul who doesn't acknowledge their need of grace. Well, participation in the kingdom does not guarantee a life free of struggle and grief. Following the way we are called to travel life's journey can save us from at least some of life's perils. The Spirit does lead us, and there are times when ignoring her leads us down pathways we were never meant to travel. Jeremiah's vision of a hot wind blowing that will scatter the people of Israel and leave the land desolate and barren suggests that this is punishment from God for a nation unwilling to listen and obey. I suspect, however, that what it really means is that people could have lessened or even avoided their calamity if they had lived by God's instruction. In their case, the hot wind is invasion of their land by the Babylonian Empire. Many people, especially the leaders and people of wealth and influence, were taken into exile in Babylon. There, far from their homeland and their people, they were unable to lead, guide, or inspire others. Many others fled Israel into a self-imposed exile in lands to the south and west. Israel became a wasteland for generations. How things might have been different for Israel if they had followed God's guidance is anyone's guess. The more pertinent question for us is, what hot wind is blowing down upon us in our place and time? The natural images of Jeremiah's vision connect us with the climate change issue for me. But with so many nations posturing and in conflict in the world, and so many issues of oppression and injustice, there are many possible answers to this question. How many of them might be lessened or resolved if humanity simply followed Christ's teachings? Of course, those of us gathered here have little to no power to impact the war between Ukraine and Russia, or resolve the flooding in Asia, or the wildfires in Europe or Western North America. But what about our individual lives? What calamities and hardships of your past could have been lessened or avoided if you had just listened to that still, small voice within and followed the Spirit instead of your brain? How many events in your future could be changed for the better? Whether we can change the circumstances of our lives or merely our response to them, the blessings of grace, joy, and contentment, and peace depend upon our willingness to admit that we are better off with Christ than without. Once we do that, he will find us and carry us home. Let's pray. Gracious God, when our spirits are lifted by the beauty of the world around us, we know your presence and power. When chaos threatens to overwhelm us and we dread the evening news, we need your presence and power even more. We give thanks that Christ seeks us out and longs to bring us back into the flock of your presence and power and your Spirit's guidance and inspiration. As we say our prayers together, aloud or in silence, we also listen for your Spirit. Speak to us, Lord. Where a word of comfort or encouragement is needed, where the inspiration to reach out to a neighbor is needed, where a healing touch or a loving word will brighten someone's day. Show us the way. 
and where the needs of our neighbors are beyond our abilities to meet. We pray that your spirit will be known and your world will be healed. By your Holy Spirit, we bring our prayers before you. We offer to you our concerns for ourselves and for others, and also our gratitude for the many blessings of your love and grace. These prayers we offer to you, O God, in the name of Jesus and by your Holy Spirit. Hear them, and in your love and wisdom, answer. Amen. Well, it might not be a surprise, but our closing hymn this week is number 266 uh, from Voices United, Amazing Grace. In gratitude for all we have received, we offer gifts back to God through the ministries of this church family and through our Mission and Service Fund. If you're enjoying these video worship services, uh, I encourage you to help support uh, the church that produces them uh, here at Wingham United Church. Uh, for the tithes and offerings we've already received, let's pray. Oh God, you provide us with such generosity. May we learn to give as you give, to foster compassion, to enlighten through teaching, to encourage talent, to empower the rejected, and to follow the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, each and every day, I urge you to open your heart to receive God's love and open your life to share it with all around you. And so we extinguish the Christ candle to mark the end of this service of worship. But we always carry the light of Christ in our hearts as we go about our day-to-day -day lives. May you see Christ in everyone you meet, and may everyone you meet see the light of Christ in you. And may the love of God, the wisdom of Christ Jesus, and the guidance and presence of the Holy Spirit lead and inspire you throughout the days ahead. Amen. Oh,